This is the second of two videos where I take old school essentials, advanced fantasy, and break it down as much as I'm able to stomach. The first video covers the player's tome, and this video covers the referee's tome. These two books are written by Gavin Norman of Necrotic Gnome, and they aim to recapitulate two old versions of Dungeons and Dragons. Those versions are the basic D&D game written by Tom Mulvey, published in 1981, and the expert set that expanded on Mulvey's basic revision, written by David Cook and Stephen Marsh, and also published in 1981. Those original rule sets came in boxed sets and over time became known as BX, short for Basic Expert. But also included in this game is Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which later came to be known as AD&D First Edition, or 1E. I go into the problems with the old school Essentials product line in the previous video, but basically it's just really confusing. As in, the names of the books and what they're supposed to contain is kind of convoluted. Fortunately, there's a way to bypass all the little booklets and confusing nomenclature on what's what and just get to the BX and AD&D 1E masterfully woven together in as few books as possible. And that's by getting your hands on OSE Advanced Fantasy Player's Tome and OSE Advanced Fantasy Referee's Tome. Like I mentioned, I unpacked the Player's Tome in the previous video. And in this video, I'll be unpacking the Referee's Tome. The big question that this book poses for me is, is OSE boring? Is it a game centered around killing and looting in order to get more powerful so that you can kill and loot better? The answer is kind of complicated and I'll get into it over the course of this video. I did a quick unboxing of the two physical books, which you can find in my previous video. Suffice it to say, Necrotic Gnome does an amazing job with their printed matter. The small sturdy books are extremely pleasurable to hold and use, and you can just tell that they will last for decades. Truly heirloom quality, as long as you aren't actively abusing them like some sort of crazy person. The first chapter of this book throws some GM advice at you, mostly pretty generic stuff, but a couple of things did jump out at me. One is this note here that says, quote, non-competitive, the game is not a competition with the players attempting to defeat the referee or vice versa. I like that notion a lot, but honestly, there are some things later in this chapter that contradict this principle a little bit. Another interesting thing is down here, it says, Quote, overuse of randomness can also spoil an adventure by derailing it too much. This was definitely a concern of mine when reading through the player's tome and seeing so many places where wandering monsters should appear. I agree that too much randomness kind of sucks, but neither here nor in the player's tome does it give you any concrete way to tamp down on the random encounters. Regarding rate of player advancement, the book says that it should take a PC three to four sessions to reach level two. Just for context, keep in mind that a level one magic user has access to exactly one spell. So that's a lot of playtime to just have one spell that you might get the chance to cast a few times in a session. It goes on to say that GMs should pump the brakes if PCs are level three by the end of the third or fourth session. So the intended pace of this game is pretty glacial in terms of level progression. So over here on the right is the first hint of the game's setting up an adversarial dynamic between GM and players but in the name of game balance. New spells should be balanced. Special abilities need to be balanced. PC wealth needs to be controlled and limited. I definitely understand that sentiment, but especially with wealth control advice, it could be a pretty frustrating situation to have a GM award treasure and then arbitrarily deprive characters of it in the name of balance. I do love the advice here about never calling a monster by its name, and for that matter, never referring to a magic item by its name. Also, never reveal a game stat of a monster or NPC. Equally good advice is to remember to make NPCs and monsters, at least ones who, that are expected to be intelligent, act intelligently. They line their layers with traps, they post guards at key points, they leverage magic and magic items logically, and they learn to adapt to PCs. It's good advice, but it does conflict a bit with that earlier advice about not being adversarial. The GM is trying to outsmart the players, Maybe all in good fun, but it's not about setting up bowling pins for the players to knock over. There's a loosely defined narrative chess at play here. The next few spreads give some generic advice on how to craft an adventure. Considering that there are whole books and very good books written on the subject of dungeon design, it's not surprising that a two-page treatment is going to feel a little sparse. You can't fault the author for organization, though. One interesting thing I found here was that one hit die monsters, that is monsters whose hit points are determined by rolling 1d8, are generally found on level one of a dungeon. Two HD monsters should be found on level two and so on. 
I thought this was a surprisingly boring and predictable way to stock a dungeon. Treasure is likewise organized by value across the levels of a dungeon. It feels like a classic arcade game or something. To be fair, this is just foundational default advice. You start here with these principles and then deviate as your heart desires. Designing a wilderness is really advice on designing a region. And I picture this happening on a hex map. The best piece of advice here is this, quote, when starting a new campaign, it is recommended to begin by detailing a small self-contained area that can be expanded over time. In other words, don't create a map of your whole homebrew kingdom and then throw it at players. Let their actions and their adventures inform the creation bit by bit. The way XP is structured and rewarded is really one of the most important details in this whole book. It says here that characters get one XP per value in gold that they receive in non-magical treasure. So 500 gold is also worth 500 XP, split amongst the party. This treasure-derived XP, the book says, accounts for 75% or more of where a character's XP will come from over time. The rest of it comes from any monster that is defeated, meaning either killed or outsmarted, captured or scared away, etc. There's a whole explanation of how XP amounts are derived from monsters, but you actually get a hard XP value for each monster in a standard stat block for this game. But what interested me most was the treasure XP. That conceit means that this game is all about looting. Let's take a look at the character's game sheet. Nowhere on this sheet does it have a space to write down your character's needs or their motivations or their goals. Really, it's just a register of abilities, maladies, gear, and possessions. Your motivation is implied very clearly through this treasure as XP rule though. You are meant to find and acquire loot, at least on the face of it. So what is standing between you and the loot most of the time? Monsters, as the game calls them. I really tried hard to rationalize away this term monsters as it is used in this case, but I just couldn't. Monsters is the wrong term for this chapter, which is composed of hundreds of stat blocks of not just monsters, but humans, demi-humans, and regular animals like bears and dogs. It would have been great to have each of these categories in separate sections, but they're all just thrown into one heap called monsters. The anatomy of a stat block is largely what makes any new supplement, quote unquote, compatible with BX or OSE. So let's break it down. First thing you have is a description. We'll flip through a few pages of the many, many pages of stat blocks here, and you'll see that most descriptions of monsters are mercifully short. After that, the first value that you'll see is the AC or armor class. That represents the monster's ability to avoid damage in combat. The first number is its AC using descending armor class rules, which use the old attack matrix that I covered in the previous video. The AC that's in brackets is the monster's AC using ascending armor class rules, which is a more straightforward application of your Thaco. Basically, you take your Thaco score, subtract the monster's ascending AC, and that's the number you're trying to meet or exceed with a D20 with modifiers. HD is hit dice, meaning the number of D8s that you would roll to determine a monster's total hit points. The number in parentheses is the average amount of hit points that you'd get if you rolled it up. Any asterisks next to the HD value represent the number of special abilities that the monster has, and this is used for manually calculating XP for defeating that monster. Another major function of the HD value is that it's the game's way of indicating the difficulty level of the monster. Quarter, half, and one HD monsters are at the bottom rungs of difficulty, and they get progressively more difficult to defeat and more valuable in terms of XP as the HD score goes up. ATT is short for attacks usable for round, and the damage those attacks do are included in parentheses. Unless it says otherwise, a monster's damage roll is not modified by strength or dex. Next is Thaco, or to hit armor class zero. Just to reiterate, this is used to calculate whether or not the monster lands an attack, taking into consideration the target's armor class. MV is movement rate, and it is written down as the monster's base movement and encounter movement rate per turn. The idea here is that any given monster will move more slowly while engaged in an encounter, one third the speed in fact. If the monster has multiple modes of movement like walking, swimming, and flying, the different movement rates are separated by slashes. SV is the monster's saving throws. I expressed my opinion on these dusty old numbers in my previous video. They're just weirdly organized, but this is part of the mystique of old school fantasy. Don't think too hard about them, just bask in the nostalgia. 
ML is short for morale rating and ranges from two to 12. Two being a monster that will never fight and 12 being one that will never really retreat under any circumstance. AL is alignment, which in the BX milieu comes in the three flavors of law, neutrality, and chaos. XP is the average of how many experience points a party will earn for defeating the monster. NA is short for number appearing, and this one's kind of complex. The first number here tells you the number of these monsters encountered in a dungeon level equal to their HD. That's if you're in a dungeon. The second number, if you're in a dungeon, tells you how many of such monsters are found specifically in a layer in a dungeon. But if you're in the wilderness, the second NA number tells you how many of such monsters are wandering in the wilderness together. And if you're in a layer in the wilderness, you multiply that second number by five. TT stands for treasure type, and that is a capital letter from A to V. Any letters from A to O indicate a hoard, and P through V for unintelligent monsters represents treasure looted from their victims. All non-human monsters have infravision, which gives them the ability to see heat and darkness up to 60 feet. This actually has a lot of implications in gameplay, and there's a ton of discussion online about what I call light economy. But generally from a setting perspective, this is a dangerous world where virtually all monsters and animals and demi-humans can lurk comfortably in the dark, while humans need torches, lanterns, and magic to keep the darkness at bay. Normal humans are actually at the bottom of the pecking order in terms of Thacko and hit dice as well. At the top of the two tables on the right here, you see NH, that's normal humans. As far as the actual stat blocks in this book, I can't go through them all, but I'll give you some broad strokes. They're classic, first of all. Also, I think that the artwork is a lot more focused on the old styles you find in the original source books compared to what you see in the OSE player's tome. Again, you're going to find virtually all creatures, including normal animals like bats and bears, thrown into this one bucket called monsters. This does make it easier to find a creature alphabetically though. Ah. Here's an example of a monster with a morale rating of 12, which means it will never retreat in a fight. Also, I think this is a British food. I don't know half the origins of all these classic monsters, but I do recognize deep ones. Actually, this entry had me pondering the question of implied setting that came up in my previous video. The question being, does this game imply a particular world? There are a lot of little hints that it does in the player's tome, but this huge hodgepodge list of monsters goes in the opposite direction. Reading through this list, which borrows willy-nilly from all kinds of cultures and legends, gives you the sense that OSC is more of a toolbox for a fantasy world that you build. By the way, I really love how concise the descriptions of dragons is on these pages. The less that is said about any given monster, the more empowered you are to fill in the blanks, the more a book just trusts you and your imagination. Also, here's an actual breath weapon in the wild, a weapon against which every monster stat block has a saving throw for, but you'll barely ever see. Even a dragon can only use their breath weapon three times a day. Take that Game of Thrones final season. Here's the Eye of Terror, the holder is trademarked. The Gibbering Mouther, another Lovecraftian horror. Here's the Lich, an ultra classic that goes all the way back, complete with epic illustration. Merchant is a great example of how it's a little awkward to list regular NPCs alongside actual monsters and beasts. Seems like a separate NPC section is warranted. Normal human has a stat block, of course. They're actually defined as any non-adventuring human. I think the more accurate name for this monster would be unarmed peasant. Here's a pterosaur described as, quote, often found in lost world regions. I instinctually know what is meant by that, but there isn't any actual information on what is a lost world in this game, nor has Necrotic Gnome, as far as I know, published any sort of lost world supplement. I think snake persons have gotten a bad rap since day one, and that unfair prejudice continues in OSE. Okay, so here's where I think the game can get potentially really boring, and that's with the encounter tables. By default, the game is having the GM roll for random encounters constantly which means just tons of monsters. And the GM has this whole table infrastructure to select monsters randomly. The problem here is the randomness itself, which the book cautions against in the introduction. I guess it's all about expectations. You're really not supposed to be going into this game expecting deep characterization or reasoning. The biggest victim though, is probably any notion of a plausible ecosystem. For example, if you play rules as written here, levels, six and seven of any dungeon in the land 
is going to have this collection of organisms roaming around it, living in a sort of uneasy, loose alliance or harmony. The book doesn't make any mention of this, but if you as a GM don't inject some meaning into these encounters, they will remain relatively meaningless. The default features of an encounter for players is survivability, potential for treasure, and potential for XP, and not much more. In fact, it could slow things down and potentially be annoying if a GM tried to interject dramatic meaning and nuance into these monster encounters if the players are in that original dungeon grind mindset. And just the sheer volume of encounters you're meant to have in this game makes injecting that kind of meaning a difficult task if you want to take on the challenge of it. Potentially a lot more interesting from a dramatic human interest roleplay perspective are the random parties of NPC adventurers that you can generate and throw at players. The book does a great, if brief, job of presenting a methodology for making these parties. It does stop short, however, of offering party motivations and complications they might harbor internally. I touched on a huge mystery in my previous video covering the player's tome where there were rules on how characters can build and maintain a stronghold, but didn't quite elaborate enough on it. In this book, you get some guidance on how to create a quick and dirty NPC stronghold, but really just a hint of what such a stronghold would entail, and no follow-up information on a player stronghold. Pretty much the rest of the 100 pages of the book deals with treasure, which is appropriate. Up front, the author warns the GM to place treasure locations in guarded spots and to spread it out carefully as to balance the player experience. I did like the information about treasure types and probabilities here, but when I see numbers like this, I immediately think that a web app would be a better way to present it. Specifically, an online generator that can produce treasure by type with the click of a button. Magic items in the game are divided into eight categories, and they are extremely varied in design and function. This is honestly the most exciting portion of the book because it gives you things that can radically change individual sessions. These four lists of miscellaneous magic items are the beating heart of this game's potential for emergent gameplay. And we're really a splash of cold water to the face when I was reading through this book in a good way. One by one, the book goes through each of these items and the whole section is very different from everything else in the book. Whereas the rules of the game and the way that monsters and everything are all presented, the author almost wants to give you the skeleton of a game and get out of the way. But with these dozens and dozens of magical items, the imagination is done for you in great detail. These items are the saving grace of the whole game in my opinion. They are the antidote to the few spells that you get at level one and the constant possibly repetitive monster encounters that you face. These items aren't really anything new as far as I can tell. I'm, I'm sitting here critiquing a couple of 40 year old games, but it's here that I'm reminded of why they're hailed as classics. It's page after page of wild game breaking magic items here, and they're presented in that clean, visually appealing OSE style. If I were to judge this book by its chapters from start to finish, I'd say that it gets better and better by chapter until you finally land on swords and specifically sentient swords. There is a really great explanation here and breakdown of how to create a sentient sword for players and how it behaves per the rules of the game. The one thing that I'd probably tweak here is that I'd apply all of these rules to other kinds of weapons as well. It should be noted that the sentient sword section is not a typical two page spread. The book, in fact, unpacks all kinds of powers that the sword can have, and it goes on for six pages total, which is a very generous amount of space when it comes to this author. One thing I didn't mention in my previous video was that Old School Essentials comes with a common open game license that allows third-party creators to make their own compatible adventures and supplements. And the amount of creativity that this OGL has spawned has more than made up for any shortcomings in the original base fantasy game. I've included a link below to those publications as categorized on DriveThruRPG. And as a good rule of thumb, if you see an OSE supplement that you might like, check Ben Milton's YouTube channel, Questing Beast, to see if he has reviewed it. He covers the lion's share of high quality OSR stuff coming out. And fairly often, that's stuff that is BX and old school essentials compatible. I've already included a lot of my opinions of old school essentials advanced fantasy in these two videos, but I'll sum it all up here in a few points. Stale oddities. I didn't really see too many offenders in the referee's tome, but the player's tome, which contains the core rules of the game, have just a whole bunch of weird little rules and mechanics that are begging to be filed off. To be fair to the original creators, 
they were a bit over their head at the time. Zeb Cook, in a recent interview, says of the time, quote, it was a lot of responsibility and we were all still so new to the whole job of creating games that we didn't even know how big a job we had taken on. I don't recall any great humorous moments, but there were definitely moments of panic. Mostly it was, OMG, this is a lot of work and how are we ever going to get it done in time? They didn't have the advantage of doing backstrokes in awesome RPGs like we do now. So judging the weird little rules in BX and AD&D 1E feels a little unfair. Product line confusion. Necrotic Gnome has a lot of fans at this point, and most of them seem perfectly fine with the utterly confusing galaxy of books and booklets that make up the OSC product line. But if you're coming in from the outside trying to figure it all out, it's just nuts. Layout. Gavin Norman should go down in RPG history as someone who took not just one, but two old games that were a complete drag to read and understand and polish them to a shine that exceeds even most modern RPGs in terms of comprehensibility and readability. When you hold the referee's tome in your hands and you have all of those monster stat blocks and classical magical items distilled into clean, readable, indexed text, you realize that you're holding something greater than the sum of its parts. Some of the credit goes to the original authors, that goes without saying, but the form and function of the books is an achievement owed to Gavin Norman, OSR Foundation. I am merely a visitor to the whole old school renaissance world of RPGs, and it's been that way for years because it's hard for an outsider to find any kind of introductory footing in this niche. As great as it is to have dozens of super interesting, wildly creative OSR games come out each year, it's frankly overwhelming for some of us. But Old School Essentials is like an island in the middle of that raging river of content. It has the twin appeal of being based on a foundational RPG series, Dungeons and Dragons, and being supremely readable and understandable. I reviewed the advanced fantasy version in these videos, but for an even easier time, you could just go for the basic fantasy version of OSC that is even easier to absorb. Let me know in the comments what your experience has been with OSE Advanced Fantasy and what kind of changes you've made to the rules to make it more to your liking. Links are below. As always, thanks for watching. See ya.